Okay, so what is classy wing sharpshooter or pesto? Long on the great great great. Oh no, sorry. Like mainly, and what's what does it spread? Here's 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 what's its geographic range here in California? Geographic range, how far does it go? Riverside? Oh, oh south, Southern California. Right? Yep, it stays pretty much in Southern California. And where do we not want to ship it? We would yeah. not have yeah. it. <laughs> Has everyone seen a glassy wing sharpshooter egg mass? It's very interesting. It's uh, the eggs are kept in a row underneath the leaks of epidermis, and so it looks like a little bumpy area. And the mother puts a layer of a white frosty coating that they don't even know really what it is, but it they thought that it's a uh, like a protectant. A sealant. So if it's white, uh, the more mature females cover what? cover the eggs with this white, dusty surface that they they accumulate here on their wings. And um, these guys uh, turn black. You can see their eyes as they develop, and so you get a little batch of these eggs all developing at one time. And Unfortunately, you can't tell the difference between eggs of, of, of related species or if they're glassy wing sharpshooter. You can't identify between eggs. There's no, <laughs> there, unless you do DNA, you can't uh, vis visually tell the difference between, you know, closely related insect eggs. Um, and so there are a number of parasites that have been released by um, the university that do parasitize glassy wing sharpshooter eggs. Um, and they're often parasitized, but uh, because it's such a good flyer, that's what makes it a good vector of the disease. It's not that it's an efficient vector as much as it is just a wide flyer. And um, they, although they have Pierce's disease up north in, in their vineyards, they do have it around the riparian areas because there's the blue-green sharpshooter that lives in the riparian areas. And it, what it does is it comes into the riparian area, areas and lives on the, the wild grapes and whatnot. And it comes into the, the cultivated grapes and spreads Pierce's disease around the edges, but since it's not a good flyer, it can't really, it doesn't really spread it into the interior of the, the growth, the orchards. And the reason why glassy wing sharpshooter is so bad is because it, it's like its mobility. It doesn't just stay near the riparian area. So that's why it's important for us not to ship it up. Um, it's just, it, it's really not, some, some vectors just can feed once on one plant for one second and give the plant the disease. It's, glassy wing sharpshooter isn't that good of a, of, a, of a vector in the sense that it, every time it feeds it definitely deposits the, um, the disease. It's just really good because it, it goes places and sees things and stuff. So, um, that's it. He's a really cool creature. Uh, you don't see it often in the field because it just happens to move around the stem, right around where you're, where, wherever it sees you, it goes to the opposite stem. So it, it has a really funny habit of just, you know, keeping away from you. Um, so more likely you'll find these eggs on the underside of citrus or something like that. Olive, they like olive. What are some of the other good uh, Raphael, Yeah, they really like citrus a lot. So, yes. I'm really having trouble hearing. Oh. Um, I, I What's wrong? Think, I think I have to hear you wrong. It's a common. Oh. Yeah. So, when you repeat Raphael, Lepsis, thanks for reminding me. She said that Raphael, Lepsis, and Magnolia, and Citrus, and all like of it's huge. It's online, but it's huge. It's a sapone lace bug, and like avocado lace bug, 
Um, when lace bugs infest the the plant, it looks a lot like a thrip infestation as far as the damage goes, because they uh, they leave a lot of debris and they they scrape a lot of cells and they they suck out the juice from the, the cells of the tissue of the plant like a thrip, and they're they're very messy. So whether you you catch the infestation of lace bug or have you heard of persea mite or um, lace? I mean, avocado lace bug. There's certain sections of av uh, avocados in the county that are infested with an avocado lace bug, mostly southeast um, in the county. And the lace bugs live on the underside of the leaf, and um, they they just really do a lot of damage. They just really turn the leaf chlorotic and um, leave a lot of debris. And But they're gorgeous to look at. So this one was introduced in, um, was first found in, Cal in California in Valley Center in 2000. <coughs> and um, you can find it on your sapotes a lot. I mean, a lot of people bring this in to the lab. Is it, is it it says at the bottom, cotton lace bug, and then you've got white uh, sapote at the top. So is this one of those bugs that actually go crosses to several plants? It does this cotton, one it does, does sapote. Yes, it's, it does do cotton, usually, and I'm not exactly sure how related sapote is to cotton, but first, you kind of want to look at, um, insects like to stick to a family, usually. So you're kind of safe with the host range if you know the insect feeds on like prunus, then you know that all of those in that family are usually susceptible. So if it's a cruciferous, a plant that likes to eat mustard, you know that all your, your brassicas are also in you know harm's way. So and that's that's true as specific as insects are. They're specific to family, and then there are some that are just polyphagous, go across family, and um, but mostly you can count on it uh, family. And I don't know whether how close the pody and why they call it cotton lace bug. Yeah, I don't know how related they are, and sometimes it's just that they've learned to. Um, they, their, their enzymes in their digestive system have learned to overcome the secondary plant compounds that the plant produces, which was originally meant for self-protection. So once the insect breaks the code for the secondary plant compound in, a, in say, cruciferous crops, then that allows it to feed on all those things in the mustard family or in the, in the um, because it can digest and not be, not not have the toxic effects of all those secondary plant compounds that that family produces. So, are you following what I'm saying about that? Okay. So, a lot of the things that that are there's not enough entomologists and very and a whole bunch of insects. So, a lot of times, the questions you're asking are things that maybe aren't known. Like I was saying about the agave mealybug, I mean, it's a huge pest right now, but it hasn't even been identified. We don't even know what species it is, but it's all throughout the county. And there's no one really there to figure it out. So sometimes it's just uh, between a wind and a prayer that we are able to develop some methods that work. And another new insect in the county as of um, probably three years ago, maybe two, 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 uh, is ficus whitefly. And we, this is another one where I think it was a homeowner that brought it in. Yeah, to our attention over in Allied Gardens that they had a tree that was just covered with whiteflies and they didn't know what it was. And indeed, um, they had a big problem. And we surveyed around that area and found uh, 
It only pretty much went around about a mile of that area. And now we're getting homeowners um, from Oceanside. There's been a Oceanside and a few other places that have brought in ficus whitefly. Now this is one of the ones that we, we intercept regularly from Florida. And so it was sort of destined to get here one way or another. Um, and it's, we're hoping that this comes under biological control because we've seen parasites working on these white flies. But the white fly is quite bad and quite extensively damaging. Um, and Jim Bethke recommended to this, this particular homeowners association that he trim back those trees hard and then treat with the systemic. And so all the new growth had the imidacloprid in it. Um, and that worked well. They called and said they really appreciated our advice. They saved their trees and it was a really good thing. Um, and, but it depends on the situation, how valuable the tree is, et cetera, et cetera. But we're hoping to find out more about the parasitoid um, in this in this white fly. So when I find, and if you find parasitized white fly, um, bring it into the lab and I can send it up to UC Riverside and maybe they can figure out what the parasite is. Yes. It went all, went all the way up to Del Cerro because we had a ficus white fly in Del Cerro last year on a, a 25 year old ficus that was about 12 feet high. Now we're still Cerro? It's beyond, it's just Maryland. east of Allied Gardens. <coughs> and we, the pr we pruned it and then we sprayed it with uh, neem oil. And, and how did that work? It worked pretty well and we just kept hosing it off with a blast of water. We just yes. kept blasting so it. Yes, stay on top of it instead of letting it get way on it. Yeah, we didn't use a systemic, we just used an organic mm -hmm. oil. Yes. What's the damage? I can't really tell from the program. Well, the leaves, major leaf drop. Oh, drop. Yeah, just defoliation. It's it's quite a bad bad pest, and it gets on both sides of the leaf, and um, that's how people usually notice it is um, leaf drop. And I'm going to ask. I have two very large plants. Um, if I'm looking for this parasite, what am I looking for? In the, well basically if you just bring in a sample of the white flies, uh -huh. then, then I can look for the parasite. If there is one. Right. Yeah, if you have pupae. Now with, with white fly, there's the white fly adult, and then there's the, yeah. um, the nymph, right? And then there's the pupa. And that's how we, determine what type of white fly is, is actually the pupa. And the parasite will be in the pupa. Mm -hmm. oh, and it will be dark. Um, the pupa isn't normally a dark color, but if it's parasitized, the parasite is, is a black. Yeah. So it will, instead of being sort of a whitish clear, it will be, have something inside there that's dark. So to call this from the regular white fly, it's one, it's on ficus. It's on ficus. Okay, and then it's on both sides of the leaves. It's, it's on both sides of the leaves. Only yes. Side, right? This is particularly aggressive, and it's why the defoliation, I think, occurs so fast. That ficus, um, to me, looks, looks similar to the type of ficus that people sometimes have inside as a house plant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is this attacking like a luminosa? <clears throat> It can attack all ficuses. Um, it likes Benjamina the most, it seems like. But it will bite on taiga and other common type landscape trees as well. And fig. Yeah, fig. That's the edible fig. The edible fig. Yeah. So keep your eye out for this one, hopefully. It's Are, aren't there roots invasive? Yeah. 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 So you don't want to close to a structure. Maybe that's good. Another category. People do like their ficus trees. Yeah. And then we have woolly white fly. Somebody, a lot of people brought in woolies uh, from their citrus. 
And I don't know how to spell Wooly, so if you send me a determination and it's Wooly, why it would be um, it will, I have like 15 different ways that I spell Wooly. So. <laughs> also, like, this is today's Wooly. Um, these guys are a horrible problem in citrus. People bring them in all the time for noticing the honeydew because they are not turning over the leaf to see the woolly white fly, and they just notice a bunch of sooty mold on their citrus. And again, it's an ant issue. Um, and uh, if you keep the ants under control in the citrus, it really doesn't get as badly out of control. Um, and again, dust on the citrus can set up for all sorts of stuff. So. With this drought and everything, really the old fashioned wash off, well, Vince Lozano's um, recommendations to hose off your plants, I cannot say how invaluable that is, and I'm so glad he's put it in writing. So, and I wish he would broadcast it everywhere because when we have all this drought and dust and, and dust getting on the leaf and Santa Ana's and everything really, you know, just hosing off the plant and allowing the photosynthesis um, really does wonders for all sorts of pests. Um, we've brought a lot of different types of plants into the area and, you know, they're, they're struggling a lot. Tomato warmer! <laughs> If you have any tomato hornworms that you want to get rid of, I will gladly accept them. We have many pets that eat tomato hornworms. We have uh, several tarantulas and scorpions that we keep for our kid displays. So we always need tomato hornworms. <laughs> and we use them for the insect festival because kids love them. Yeah. Alive. 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 With darkened <laughs> eggs on its back and it's in your garden, leave it alone. Let it let it move. Also, if you ever have a caterpillar that is crawling up onto the top of the leaf of a plant and it turns black, it has been infest, infected with the baculovirus, and you want it to. You don't want to pick that off. That is, it's it's the virus takes over, changes its behavior. And it crawls to the top of the plant, and then it kind of it disintegrates into the soupy mess. But it's letting all of the spores sporulating all over, and so that virus is, is going onto the plant so that the next caterpillar that eats it um, will get infected. So when you see a sick caterpillar, resist. <laughs> you know, let it let it live, or let it finish what it's doing because. It probably has something contagious, and uh, you don't have to spread on your caterpillars. Um, you've heard about like different trophic reactions. That's where the parasite actually cues in on the feeding of the the plant is releasing secondary compounds, and the predator actually instead of trying to sniff out the the larva that's feeding on the leaf sniffs out the plant that's feel that's sending out wounding um, signals, and then they attack. So sometimes these predators um, are looking for wounded plants, and that's how they find their prey. So don't turn off your your tomatoes. <laughs> And dry, dusty conditions are mites' favorite place to be. Because the mites are often kept in check by um, 
fungi, the fungal um, disease, which thrives on moist conditions. If you want to have fungi control your pests, you've got to have a certain amount of moisture in the air. And um, so when you have dry and dust, this the, the mites just come in, period. So if you find mites, you know you're not, you're having it too dusty and too dry. Um, everybody knows about eucalyptus leaf beetle. No? No. no. <laughs> there are two beetles that feed on eucalyptus that really aren't worth your distinguishing them between each other. There's the tortoise beetle and the eucalyptus leaf beetle. They both love eucalyptus leaves. They both require the same type of control. Um, I don't know much about the biological control in this system. It, uh, I know that a lot of growers have to treat for it because they do so much damage to the cut foliage and they, you know, growers in this area really grow a lot of eucalyptus for export. So um, it's a real bane of, uh, of growers' existence here. And for most, like, landscapers, it's not eucalyptus leaf beetle, it's the psyllid that causes trouble. And the psyllid, and there's a snout beetle that are under good biological control, but these two critters here, the eucalyptus leaf beetles and the tortoise beetles, really are not really under good biological control. Yes, well, they do, and it's really not worth your time to really figure out who's doing the damage. Just kill them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bougainvillea looper, it goes, it, people do call about this, and, you know, if, if, it, if their Bougainvillea is just getting a couple of bites taken out of it, it's usually like a grasshopper. But if it's getting pummeled by something, it will be the bougainvillea looper. And it shows up sporadically. I wish I had, I don't really know why it shows up at certain places and certain times, but it's very sporadic is all I can say. And, but you will have calls about it. Like I talked about citrus leaf miner, um, you can try setting out the citrus leaf miner traps. And different things in the UC IPM <coughs> measures do work. Has everybody seen Asian citrus psyllid yet? Not in person. Not in person? Yeah. Okay, so um, they have collected a egg or a nymphal parasite in from Pakistan that is matched climatically matched <coughs> to our area that they are releasing in LA and San Diego. Uh, we are actually trying to find good citrus psyllid populations in South County for them to release. So if anybody we try to track where the, the new spots are in South County so that they can release the parasite there. So if you happen to live in South County and happen to know of a good Asian citrus psyllid population, please let us know. And um, the, the parasite is, uh, shows some hope, quite a great deal of hope for backyard gardeners um, because it it feeds on nymphs and eggs, and uh, they're recovering it from the environment. So there's quite a bit of hope on this. Um, with Asian citrus psyllid, we have not found Wang Long Bing in California, the disease that it carries, except for up in LA, uh, one tree. And there's an extensive sampling program going on to check plants for Wang Wang Bing in Central Valley in Southern California. We've given up trapping and detecting in this area. We know that Asian citrus psyllid is here. It's infested our area and you cannot move plants 
citrus plants or family in the Rutaceae out of Southern California legally because it might have Wang Long Bing and it might have Asian citrus psyllid in it. Um, so we're looking for Asian citrus psyllid nymphs that have feeding damage or a parasite developing in them. And so if you see anything, again, when the nymph or the pupa is darkened, that usually means it has a parasite inside. So if you see anything interesting like that, Dr. Mark Cottle up at the university and all sorts of people at the Citrus Research Board want to know about the success of the parasitoid that they released. Um, always after the Asian citrus psyllid arrives, then the disease follows. So we, there's just a big push to try to keep California long, long being free. Um, and we're just hoping for that. But as you know, it could be a lot like Pierce's disease. Yes. I know that the, 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 the disease long, long being came in through the graph that was up in the Los Angeles area. How long before that, or do you know how long before it was the Asian citrus psyllid here in Southern California that, that then it was able to, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Don't yeah, like luckily this. it wasn't, it, luckily for us, um, Asian, Asian citrus psyllid was found in San Diego in 2008, and we found it in LA, in a, in, and that was just south of the border. And we kind of kept it from spreading throughout San Diego County until last year. In LA, it was a different situation where they didn't set up traps in the urban areas until about 2009. And there they found that the whole urban basin was inundated with Asian citrus psyllid already because they missed it. But at that very time is when they actually started sampling the plant tissue and found that one tree that somebody had brought over from Asia and grafted, they grafted a piece on. So really that tree in the graft wasn't there very long with the psyllid in proximity. As far as I know, it could have just been a year or two speculating. Because I'm assuming they didn't come together. I'm assuming that they were two separate. Separate, totally. <coughs> yes, but, yes. But, but fairly close together. Yes, very close together. And luckily, it doesn't appear that the, the feeding on that tree happened, if at all, for very long by Asian citrus psyllid. So it luckily was a graft situation that they were most afraid of because the person knew how to graft, grafted it onto their tree, and proceeded to give grafts away to their friends. So they've tried to trace forward all the people that received gifts of grafting. <laughs> um, and then they, of course, they did a very uh, intense eradication right around that tree. So if they weren't there for very long, lucky for us, together. May I ask another question? So it's all citrus, and does the damage look like the lower left-hand corner? Now there's two damage. There's two damaging things. There's a, there's a psyllid damage, which looks a lot like aphid damage. It can be pretty much indistinguishable with the curling of the leaf. The mother Asian citrus psyllid only lays her eggs on brand new tissue. Otherwise, she just hangs around and waits for that tree to create feather flush. She hangs on the, on the bark and in covered places. That's the only place you'll find nymphs, is on feather flush. So you don't have to waste your time looking all around the old, old leaves. You just go right to the apical meristem of your tree and look. That damage is different from the disease damage. The, now, the Asian citrus psyllid damage is not bad as far as 
anything like, I mean, it's just comparable to the aphid. It's what they carry, just like Pierce's disease is carried by glassy wing sharpshooter. You don't really notice glassy wing sharpshooter damage, but you'll notice the disease it spreads. So with Wang Long being, it is asymmetrical modeling of the leaf. So does, uh, it looks very similar to nutrient deficiency, except that it's asymmetrical. So along the mid vein of the leaf, when a, you have magnesium or zinc deficiency, you get yellowing. But in Wang Long Bing, there are splotches of yellow that don't pair up with the other side on the other side of the mid vein. And it is very difficult to diagnose by the eye. And frankly, it's better off just being sent to the lab for DNA analysis. And the other thing is that part of the tree can show it and other parts can't. And this is why you test for Wang Lung Bing, it's almost better to collect the insect because the insect is collecting the disease in its digestive system or the flow on the um, with, with Pierce's disease in the sharpshooter, it's xylem that the, that the bug feeds on. In Asian citrus psyllid and citrus, it's the phloem. And so the little critters act like a little uh, concentration mechanism of the phloem. So when they take a bunch of um, psyllids and mash them up, then they can test the DNA from the psyllids to see if they carry Wang Wang Bing. And that's actually more efficient than going and sampling a leaf from here and a leaf from there and a leaf from there because the, the disease expresses itself in different ways at, at different parts of the tree. So it's really confusing. And, um, and it's really hard to differentiate it from the nutrient deficiencies. But if you bring it in, Pat will look at it. And if it looks strange, uh, a lot of times people can have and have been successful in bringing in Wang Lung Bing samples in Florida, for example, and been correct. So you, you, it's not a hopeless situation, it just takes practice. The problem here is that San Diego, we have such, we have trees that look much yellower in general compared to Florida. They, are, they have a lot of green foliage. We, we tend to have more yellow uh, leaves. So it's really hard to differentiate, but keep looking. Are there any more questions? But it also affects the fruit, from what I understand, right? The inside of the fruit can grow crooked. You know, By that time, it doesn't yeah. get it. It loses its sweetness. I think. Yes, it that's the flavor. That is the green. whole. Yes, and those are that's the advanced condition of the disease when the fruit is no longer usable, which is why it kills the tree and it renders the fruit unedible. Right. It's bitter fruit. Mm -hmm. And so um, by the time you're getting fruit, we want to catch it long before the fruit is ruined. Mm -hmm. um, because every, the more you wait to get to, to remove that infected tree, the more that's a reservoir for the psyllid mm -hmm. to spread the disease to all the other trees around it. So in big operations in Florida and Brazil, they're out looking, looking, looking in their orchards, and as soon as they see a tree that has any sign, they take it down and replant. And the trees only last six to eight years in those circumstances, so they only get four years of yield out of them. And then it gets infected and, and can't, doesn't taste good. So it's called citrus greening because it makes the citrus green and never ripens. Mm -hmm. um, I turned in several citrus leaves from the one remaining tree we kept on our property when we inherited this one tree. We took everything out of our property because everything was diseased. And um, I, I probably missed every disease in the book, but what I was wondering is if one of us has, for example, my citrus tree, has something like that, are you going to notify us or not? When I turn in my uh, if an notice. army of regulatory officials show up at your property, <laughs> 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 it has to be notified. I'm serious. I'm serious. Oh, really? Yeah, you would be notified. 
I haven't heard of that as part of the symptoms. That would be something else. Stress trees do fruit drop, drug stress trees, you know, that kind of thing. But I haven't heard of Wong Wong being positive for strong. Well, nobody showed up. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to get a good sample, and it's mostly nutrient deficiency. So, yeah. So, did you submit it with paperwork and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. I don't even know what kind of citrus it is. But right now, it only has two fruits that are really kind of developing. We don't even know what kind of citrus it is. I just proved it severely fed it, and I'm trying to salvage it, but I don't, I don't know if I can. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it might be a, it might be a good time to replant. <laughs> okay, so um, this is huge for California, and unfortunately, everybody's running out of money, and it's looking pretty grim. But we'll we try.